Welcome everybody. Uh, Dr. Enan Rudell is a licensed psychotherapist and a leadership psychologist. He has served as teaching faculty in the fields of organizational psychology and clinical social work. As a nonprofit administrator, he has overseen efforts to meet objectives in human resources, programming, strategic growth, and staff development. In his work as a psychotherapist, he has provided treatment in a broad range of settings, including hospitals, community-based organizations, and private group practice. His research focuses on the intersection of social architecture, emotional intelligence, diversity, and leadership. Dr. Rudell holds a PsyD in organizational leadership psychology from our very own William James College and an MSW in clinical social work. Dr. Rudell, welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Gloria, and good morning uh, to everyone. Um, when given the opportunity to speak on the legacy of Dr. King, I found myself recalling one of his many calls to action where he noted, the time is always right to do what is right. As we reflect on the life of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., I ask that we take a few minutes to consider our own community here at William James College. As for us, the time is now, as we have found ourselves living in unprecedented times. Perhaps now more than ever, it is imperative that we embrace Dr. King's vision. The time for us to reaffirm our commitment to social justice is now. And for staff, faculty, alumni, and students alike, this call to action rests solidly upon our shoulders. As William James College strives to create the leaders of tomorrow, we must ask ourselves, how does Dr. King's vision show up in the William James community? To what degree are we allowing the principles that he stood for to inform this institution's mission and vision? And perhaps most importantly, to what degree do these principles inform how we engage with one another? As a former student and current member of faculty, I serve as proof of the notion that leadership at William James College strives to embrace Dr. King's vision of diversity, equity, and inclusion. The guidance, support, and mentorship that I received as a student throughout my time in the OLP program has profoundly impacted my personal and professional growth. For me, William James College has been transformational beyond what I could have ever imagined or hoped for. Today, on Dr. King's birthday, we welcome Dr. Brianna White as our guest speaker. Dr. White is a clinical psychologist who serves as the assistant director and identity focused specialist at Student Counseling Services at Connecticut College. There, she provides individual and group psychotherapy to student clients, coordinates the center's pre and post doctoral training programs, and develops and implements psychoeducational programs for the campus community. She teaches counseling, gender, and women's studies, and personal development oriented courses for undergraduate and graduate students at her graduate alma mater, the University of Rhode Island. Her outreach, training development and facilitation and specialized clinical work addresses identity related competence, awareness of socio-political realities and inequity in college mental health. A primary focus of Dr. White's work across contexts is the interplay between aspects of identity and psychological functioning. The aim of the aforementioned focus is to facilitate the development 
of professional competencies for colleagues and graduate student trainees and personal capacities for those she serves in classrooms and therapy rooms to enable ethical engagement of self and others in particular around aspects of identity. Dr. White is also in a self-described perpetual process of tending to her own related professional and personal capacities. And with that, it is my pleasure and honor to introduce our guest speaker today, Dr. Brianna White. Thank you for that lovely introduction, Dr. Bell, and for those really thought-provoking words um, around the legacy of Dr. King and how we integrate that into kind of programmatic work at the college, but then also our work as individuals. Um, and that actually is going to be, I'm gonna share my screen with you all right now. Are you all able to see some slides in front of you? Nod, ah, thank you, okay. So that actually is gonna be a primary focus of my remarks here today. I have been thinking a lot lately, um, given everything that's been happening in the nation around us and in the larger world, about the question of where we go from here in terms of a Kingian legacy, in terms of work towards equity and justice, but really thinking about it um, from a personal responsibility standpoint and really thinking about how I can empower myself and empower other people to use their agency to engage that work, in particular during times when that work seems perhaps more difficult than ever because of what is going on around us. So as I mentioned, um, the title of my talk today is Where Do We Go From Here? And I'm hoping that this talk will serve as an opportunity for us to really reflect and to actively engage, and there are going to be some moments for um, dialogue and conversation later on that will help us to do that. So I want to begin by kind of giving you an overview of what we're going to be doing today. And these four things are exactly that. I'm going to very briefly frame the present conversation, my talk. Um, I'm going to have you all engage in a reflective activity, which Gloria mentioned at the start point of our time together. Um, then I'm going to share some of my own musings and reflections and give you kind of a model of the way that I propose engaging reflectively and reflexively around this uh, topic of how you move towards equity and justice. And then the piece that I am most excited about um, for our time together today is the opportunity to really talk about these, these things. And you'll notice that I'm looking towards my right a little bit as I speak. And I should explain that I'm doing that in part because I have your faces visible in this right-hand corner of my screen and my slides that are coming up in the center point. So excuse me if it seems like I'm not looking in the uh, correct direction. So to begin with some framing, when we think about methods of determining our direction, where we're going from here, my talk title, I think that it, how you get there depends a whole lot on both the goal whether or not how you get to a destination matters, right? When you're just trying to get somewhere quickly and efficiently, and it kind of doesn't matter how you get there, you just need to make it happen. And ideally, maybe safely, you want to get there safely too. You're going to make use of all of your modern technology. You might ask Alexa, and you might turn to Siri or Google Maps and get yourself there in as few turns as possible with as little impact of traffic and things like that as possible. But when where you're going, is towards equity and justice. When where you're going impacts the daily lives of people, when where you're going impacts your life and your safety and your freedom, it's important to take a more thoughtful and strategic approach. And I propose that engaging reflective skills and engaging reflexive skills is the way to help you make um, a journey in an ethical way that arrives that helps you to arrive at your destination in a way that not only gets you there, but gets you there well. And it gets you there in a way that really um, speaks to the value of the journey. So in the context of Martin Luther King Day, which is going to be arriving on Monday for all of us in just a few days, I think that's the piece of reflection and thinking about the past that we want to consider, really reflecting on the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in order to inform our forward movement. Another point of reflection that is, I think at this point in the beginning of 2021, maybe the most difficult, is really thinking critically about where we are, where our nation is at this moment in terms of equity and justice, right? And some obstacles therein. 
And then really thinking reflexively about our own values, our own goals, and the things that should inform our forward movement towards equity and justice. And again, I think the middle component of thinking about where we are presently is at this moment, perhaps more difficult than thinking about the Kenyan legacy in the past and or thinking about the goal and the dream of equity and justice for our nation, right? So that's where I wanna spend a little bit of time on today is focusing on the present because again, it's the least difficult place or the most difficult place to be in the present day. So Gloria mentioned the cloud exercise um, that I'm wanting you all to engage in and she pasted a link as well as a code to access the cloud exercise. That's gonna help us kind of engage in that reflexive process of thinking about our own values and how that might inform our goals and our hopes for our society. And so if you could, I'd like you to take a moment now and go to that link and respond to the two prompts that are gonna be offered there. Um, and those prompts are first, what are your hopes for our collective societal future? And the second prompt is what are the values that inform those hopes? Now you can take some time to respond to those, um, to those prompts, those questions. And you can do that as I speak or as things kind of occur to you, it'll be open throughout the entire time that we're meeting together. And then as I wrap up, we're gonna come back to those responses. We're gonna take a look at them collectively and as a community and discuss them because I am really interested to hear um, about where you all fall in that reflective practice about thinking about yourself and your values and how that informs where you want our society to go. So, the start point of thinking about where we go from here and how we get there, as I mentioned before, is thinking about the past and where we're located. And in terms of today's conversation, really thinking about the legacy of Dr. Luther King Jr. So you all, I imagine, because you are people who self-selected to show up for a Martin Luther King Day uh, talk, you're all probably pretty well aware of the legacy of King. Right, you're aware of the mid-century, mid-19, hundred um, century aims, movement aims for civil rights and for equity and for justice, where the focus really was on making institutions and services accessible for folks of color, black folks in particular and very specifically, working towards protection under the law, working to ensure safety, and this last piece of working to ensure tolerance of difference and specifically racial difference. Um, and we can broadly reflect on BIPOC communities, but really in terms of the 1954 to 1968 movement, it was focused on black folks in America, right? And I put an asterisk, an asterisk next to the term tolerance because I really do think that that was the most that folks felt they could request at that time. And understandably so given what was going on in our nation with regard to racism and institutionalized racism and racism that was permissible under the law that led to unsafety for black folks in America. So given those aims, there were so very many gains that were achieved by the movement between 1954 and 1968, right? There were a number of legal cases that led to increased equity, that led to access to education, that led to um, the allowance of interracial marriages and the abolition of miscegenation laws. There were a number of civil rights acts that were passed that provided protection in terms of the housing market, that provided protections in terms of people's um, workforce participation and protection from discrimination therein. There was really importantly and timely the 24th Amendment, which allowed for folks to vote in federal elections. Right, and also related to the gains of the civil rights movement in the states at this time, there were a number of specific agencies that were created to facilitate institutional change. Now, I will be sharing um, these slides with Gloria and Anne, and she will send them out to you. And I'm telling you that because I've included on this slide links to some really brief information about all of these gains, because I knew that I wasn't going to have the opportunity or time to get into them in detail today but I wanted to put them out there just as a reminder of some of those things. And for folks who have maybe forgotten some of the things that they learned maybe in grade school at some point during that one week in which you talked about the civil rights movement and Martin Luther King's legacy, you can kind of go back and get that information very quickly and very easily from here. And again, when we're thinking about reflecting on the past and the legacy, I think having information is imperative and using the tool of the internet that gives us easy access to that information can really aid in that. 
So again, in thinking about our forward movement towards equity and justice, this middle piece, this difficult piece, is thinking really critically about where we are in the present moment. What is our current location? We know where we are coming from in terms of the legacy, but where we are sitting right now can really help to inform our forward movement. And importantly, we can't think about where we are ideally sitting, right? We can't think in a way that, um, that negates the realities of our present world and the present moment and the difficulties that are ahead of us and that we're currently facing. We've got to really be able to think critically and accurately about where we are. And in moments when we don't have enough information, we need to seek that information. Um, and I would argue that that is our ethical duty to do that. And so in thinking about where we are, especially um, in terms of very recent days, I think the metaphor of a dumpster fire is really an appropriate one. And I'm sure you all have heard this before, people saying 2020 has been just a dumpster fire. And I put this here both to add some levity ease our difficulty sitting at the present moment, but also to highlight how truly difficult our present moment is in terms of thinking about equity and justice. Um, I don't know how many of you all have actually ever been in contact with a dumpster fire, but I'm imagining that it's not a common occurrence for you all. But when we think about this metaphor, um, some components that I think really help me to sit with it are the idea of the scent of burning garbage that might be located in a dumpster. Sitting with how striking it looks to see a dumpster floating down what was a street before that street was flooded. Thinking about not only what it's like to be around it and to experience it in a sensory sort of a way, which I think is exactly how we're experiencing the present moment in the most recent year in a really visceral sensory sort of a way, but also experiencing intellectually the extent to which it seems so odd and out of place in terms of our daily life. It's not every day that I look out of my window and I see a dumpster floating down the street on fire and then have to grapple with what do I do about this? What do I do with this striking image, right? So I think this is an apropos and irreverent sort of a metaphor for the present moment. In more kind of concrete terms, where we are is truly a place of difficulty. Our degradation of the environment of the earth that we inhabit has led to uncontrollable fires in California. It's led to the devastating effects of natural disasters elsewhere in the regional south. We've witnessed the death of so many black and brown folks at the hands of our police, the very people who are um, trusted to protect us and to protect our safety, right? They've done just the opposite of that in so many cases. And I've got the image of, of Breonna Taylor, George Floyd um, there on the screen. Also, we have very recently experienced domestic terrorism in a way that's been novel for us in the States and our reckoning with it has been particularly novel, right? Folks stormed the Capitol, arguably, in response to racist, anti-Semitic rage, enraged at the current political system in which perhaps they're feeling their grasp on power and security and centrality as somehow shifting, and this is the response to it. We also saw the, um, the government's mismanagement of that situation as being something that made it worse rather than better that kind of stirred up and inflamed violence rather than quelling it in the way that it perhaps should have. And all of this, when we're thinking about where we are in this present moment, has been happening on the backdrop of a devastating virus, right? Our lives have been shifted to remote operations. I've got an image of someone working from home on a computer. All of our gatherings are now happening in this remote sort of a way, which gets in the way of the sorts of connections that we've um, really come to value and we need as human beings. And we've seen our medical infrastructure just buckle under the sheer number of cases and our difficulty doing the things that we need to do to decrease the number of cases. Um, notably, and preparing for this talk, I have been today this week looking up the recent death rates. And most recently, as of 8 a.m. this morning in the United States, we've lost 389,000 human beings to the coronavirus globally two million people have died, right? 
And so we have got all of these social things going on, these socio-political things happening with the backdrop of this really devastating health crisis and pandemic that we're facing. And importantly, while these are two separate things, one certainly amplifies the other. We're seeing inequities that we know have been a part of our society for a while and that are directly related to work for civil rights and work for equity and justice. We're seeing those be manifested in our healthcare systems. We're seeing those be manifested into the extent to which the virus is deadly in communities that have been historically underserved by medical systems, right? And who don't have access to the things that lead to like a solid foundation of physical health, right? The least of which, of course, is the devastating um, pressure of injustice and inequity. So even outside of the physical health components, there are a number of mental health components that play a significant role in the different impact of the coronavirus on particular communities. And of course, the economic tie-in has so much to do with the disparate impact of the virus on particular communities, right? And this directly relates to work towards equity and justice and factors that we have to consider if we're thinking critically about the present moment in a way that informs our forward movement. So another component of where we are right now in the present moment related to work towards equity and justice and forward movement therein is how very difficult the present moment feels. I said before that I think sitting with where we are is maybe one of the most difficult seats of determining our direction. And part of that is because sitting with where we are is really awful and really painful. It doesn't simply smell bad and surprise us in the way that a dumpster fire might. It also feels devastating in the way that losses of millions of human people is devastating. Um, in a lot of ways, I think we were feeling underprepared for the present moment and that exacerbated its impact on us. Also, it has felt very much that the present moment has been one in which so much backward movement in terms of the gains of the civil rights movement um, of the 50s, 60s, and 60s, it felt like the current administration has really done a lot to undo a lot of those gains and a lot of that work. Um, and that's been a reality. Thankfully, that will change in just a few days. But even that, the baseline work of the incoming administration is impacted by what's been undone by the current administration in terms of civil rights and protections under the laws for particular communities. And that makes the present moment feel just awful. Some of the related, though novel moments that I would argue are points of hope that can inform our forward movement include the awareness of inequity, specifically race-based inequity, right? As a result of the pandemic, folks were forced to simply stand still and sit and observe sociopolitical realities that they had the privilege to avoid observing and acknowledging and honoring prior to this point. But because folks were at home, because many were without work, because the pandemic has disproportionately infected BIPOC communities, impoverished communities, um, and folks struggling in different ways who our society has not done a good job of tending to and taking care of. And we've all witnessed it. We're now more aware than ever of these inequities. And when I say we, I mean the expansive we, and that again, those of us who self-selected to attend a Martin Luther King um, Day event may have been aware of these things before. I would hope that we were. But we now have more people who've joined in this conversation, who've shown up, and been present to confront these realities and to determine, so what is our future direction? What do we do in response to these realities than we've ever been? And that is a point of hope. Also something that in particular, if you work with young adults, can be a really important thing to keep in mind and that I think is easily forgotten by today's youth um, and young adult population is that we have done this before, maybe not exactly this, but so much of this we have done before and so much of what we can take away from the Kingian legacy is the way that you speak truth to power and the way that you fight for justice and equity, even when it is difficult to do so and when it comes with risks and costs. Also, now more than ever, we have resources to approach this work. The advent of social media makes the documentation of injustice so much easier than it is otherwise. Also, the advent of social media allows us to connect with one another in terms of work towards resistance in a way that we haven't been able to do quite so easily before. 
And those are important things to keep in mind. Additional points of hope are um, things that are kind of um, kind of brought to mind by the images that I have here on the slide and that medical advances have led to the creation of vaccines that ideally will lessen the death rate of the coronavirus. We have seen our frontline workers, healthcare workers in particular, really stepping up in ways that none of us probably knew were possible because they hadn't been needed before. And that is evidence of human resilience. We have also seen a hope in change reflected in some of the very people who have been members of organizations and workforces that have engaged in brutality against black and brown bodies. We've seen shifts and changes, even though they seem far and few in between, they're present. In this image right here, we have police folks kneeling in solidarity with folks who are protesting brutality, right? And unjust killing of brown people by the police. And also, we again have a society that is newly aware and that is showing up and resisting and marching as if their lives depend on it. And importantly, it's not simply the people whose very lives do depend on it who are showing up. There is the solidarity of folks in communities that might be impacted in lesser ways, whose safety is not directly at risk, that are showing up and resisting. And this is, I think, a particular we hope inducing reality that's a part of our present moment. So in thinking about what the present work is, because again, this is a part of our present moment, right? Um, it's important, I think, when we think about the King and Legacy, where the goal was primarily focused around racial and socioeconomic justice, to go back to the communities that we're talking about and that we're the center of that work and a part of that legacy. And so there is a um, large umbrella organization called the Movement for Black Lives, which includes under it a lot of other um, organizations like the Black Lives Matter movement. And they have a set of six demands for or on behalf of the black community that I think um, serve as really nice uh, points or aims or goals of the current movement. And those aims are as follows, simply ending the war on black people right? So ending anti-Black ideologies, ending anti-Black legislation, ending anti-Black action that's taken. Reparation and making amends in really tangible and strategic ways for the wrongs that have been done to the Black community and underserved communities. Divesting from institutions and policies and things that underserve communities of color and investing and in things that serve well communities of color and investing in things that are products of the communities of color, right? Economic justice, which is such a central component because understandably economics intersect with all of these other sorts of components of um, justice, right? And thinking about climate justice and thinking about housing justice and thinking about racial justice, gender justice. Um, sexual and oriented, sexual orientation justice, all of those things are directly tied to economics and about our healthcare system. Also, a goal and a focus and a demand for community control, right? So to see oneself reflected in the agencies that serve a community, to insist on representation, to insist on that sixth um, demand, which is political power, insisting on governmental representation, right? The government must represent the people that it serves. And importantly, while this is not articulated as one of the demands of the movement for black lives, I think it's an underlying sort of a theme is moving beyond the tolerance that was a goal of the earlier civil rights movement, right? Moving beyond the tolerance and working for something more, something that is more than simply tolerating difference rather Something that is kind of akin to celebrating difference, exploring difference courageously, being invested in promoting and amplifying distance as an asset rather than something that just gets in the way from the norm, from the centered identity in the room. And I think that's where we are presently in terms of the aims of our work towards equity and justice. So again, when we think about where we're going from here, and we know that our, input, our end point is equity and justice. And we acknowledge that that end point is not static or stagnant. Rather, it's probably a constantly moving target that we have to be actively working for. 
thinking critically about ourselves and our values and then allowing those values to inform that movement and those efforts is imperative. So for me, I have here kind of a model of how I do that. And that's not to say that this is the only way of doing it. It's not to say that it's the right way of doing it. Rather, it's to say that it's a way that's working for me right now in the present moment, which is real difficult to sit in for me personally. Some of the values that I consider that inform my forward movement are the principles of Kwanzaa, which I just wrapped up celebrating on the first of the year. So thinking about and Kwanzaa, for those of you who might be unfamiliar um, with it, is a black community celebration that happens between the 26th of December and the 1st of January that came out of the need in the state around the time of the civil rights movement to really work um, against anti-black sentiments, both those experienced from outside of the community and those that were internalized within the community that were manifested in how we treated each other, how we engaged ourselves and each other in ways that were absolutely reflective of racial trauma. And so the idea of these principles of Kwanzaa are really about celebrating and honoring blackness and celebrating and honoring the black community and celebrating and honoring black individuals. And so the principles that again, really inform things that I allow to lead my forward movement towards equity and justice are unity within the community and among black folks, self-determination, collective work and responsibility. So collaboration and taking ownership of our role in one another's life and our role in one another's well-being and the acknowledgement that what we do individually impacts our larger communities. Thinking about cooperative economics and investing in black businesses and finding black businesses to invest in is a timely thing to be focusing on and so imperative for any kind of a community up because again, economics has a whole lot to do with um, communities functioning and positionality. Thinking about purpose, thinking about setting goals, thinking about creatively pursuing those goals and nurturing our own internal and our community creativity through the arts. Um, and then importantly, this last piece on faith, which is really secular in nature rather than a religious sort of a faith conceptualization. It's about the idea of having faith in yourself, having faith in your community and having faith in humanity, right? So knowing that even if we are not where we need to be right now, we have got the capacity to move towards where we need to be, that there are people within and outside of our communities who are invested in our forward movement towards um, where we need to be. When we can think about our values and think about allowing them to inform our forward movement. It can result in a shift in how we engage in the world around us. So for me, these particular values, they inform my sense of my own full humanity and the full humanity of other people, which then leads me to be deeply invested in ethically engaging the people around me and myself, right? It leads to a sense of investment in liberation in both focusing on self-liberation, right? And freeing myself from a colonized mind that's impacted by society around me in negative ways, but then also engaging other people. So both young folks in the classrooms that I serve in, um, young folks, excuse me, in the therapy rooms that I serve in, but then also my colleagues, my friends, my family members. It informs a want to engage everyone around me in a way that leads towards liberation. Also, thinking about the goals of the movement for Black Lives, right? Those goals are very much consistent with these principles and keeping those goals as those focal points that you're moving towards um, can result from having these values. And then also working towards anti-racism not simply not being racist or having racist ideology, but actively working against racism, um, a la Ibram X. Kendi, right? That can absolutely be informed by these principles and by these values. And the last point that I have here on this slide is this idea of connecting and cooperating. So community action, community engagement, coalition building and solidarity are things that only result from, for me, these principles and these values in my sense of others in my own full humanity, therefore my sense of connectedness to other folks and also my sense of responsibility to work towards justice, not just for myself, not just for my loved ones, but for all people, right? That I'm morally obligated and responsible to do that. 
because of these values. So at this point, I would invite Gloria to pull up the results of our cloud activity. And I want to hear from you all what some of your hopes for our societal future are and then what some of the values and principles are that underlie those hopes. So Gloria, are you able to? Yeah, so um, while Sandra- I will stop sharing. If that, you can post mm -hmm. those last slide questions into the chat and then I will pull up the- Okay. Okay, let's see if I can. Okay. And now I just lost that. Okay, are you able to see what I posted in the chat, Gloria? Is that there? And so how can those values and hopes inform our effortful forward movement toward equity and justice? Okay. Okay, so that's visible. Great. We have our first um, so, uh, pulled up. Wonderful. So it looks like in response to this first prompt, Oh, you all came up with some wonderful things. Service, understanding, equity, peace, respect, unity, justice, liberation, civility, social justice, compassion, fair and unbiased justice. Yes, balance, community connection. Oh, wonderful, civil liberties for all. More civility and respect, humility, hope, affirmation. Yes. So for some folks, I know there are a good number of us here. Um, do we have any present who are willing to share how they arrive at these hopes? Where do these hopes come from? You have the ability to unmute yourself. And so go ahead and unmute yourself and share, please. Um, this is Angelette. Um, these the hope for me with in civil liberties for all. Um, it came from um, just being an African American woman um, who's grown up with a disability and have seen disparities against myself, my family members, and in my community, my entire life, and in present moment. Um, <sighs> Unrest, civil unrest just brings more um, sadness for me um, because it's like, you know, the hope is what I was taught was you grow up, you become mature, your actions are different from when you were younger. And it's like in our nation, our actions have not had any change or any, there hasn't been any shifts. There's just been the same behaviors and actions throughout the country throughout this nation and that's really really sad i mean there has been changes you know, showing a slide but you know the civil liberties has not changed and the just racism just ah, i'm done <laughs> absolutely thank you for that angela yeah so your hopes come from your lived experience yeah. of what the absence of this reality has been like in your life absolutely anyone else This is uh, Rebecca. Um, for me, like I was thinking about unity um, and I know uh, I and a lot of my peers have been struggling with this idea of there's so, so many divides and you want unity, but also you understand that this is, a, the, the, these are issues that you can't really middle ground. You're like it's not, you know, something that we can get together and just find a compromise. It's this is, we're talking about human rights and things that people need to survive and live and thrive. And it's, it's not something that it's like, yeah, we can have disagreements about different things, but like, this is not one of them. And so I've seen a lot of my friends and even myself who have had to cut ties with family members and close friends because we can't, we can't, you know, budge on this. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you for that, Rebecca. I think that is such an important point um, because I think a lot of folks are grappling with that right now, right? This idea of the want for a future where there is unity, but the acknowledgement that at the present that unity cannot be because to ask you to be in connection with someone who is not in support of your rights and your safety or that of other people is actually not a healthy sort of a thing. I think the important thing to keep in mind, and this is something that I do around that struggle, is the idea of the difference between what you need to do in the present and what you want in the future. And the acknowledgement that setting boundaries in the present can facilitate that unity and that connection in the future, right? Even if those boundaries right now lead to distance between folks, you know? Anyone else? on their hopes for our societal future and where those hopes come from. I'll just add, uh, first of all, thank you, Dr. White. This was a really um, informative and inspiring presentation. Um, I think for myself, and I apologize because I didn't get the chance to throw this in here, but I want to add the word curiosity um, and again, to the point of, you know, the last person, it's hard to come to uh, civility or unity when there is such discrepancy. Um, and I found for myself, attempting to come from curiosity or wanting to sort of understand where is the other person coming from? How did they get to this conclusion? Are there exceptions to, you know, the way we feel that they are ingrained from their, you know, parents, et cetera. So sort of, yeah, attempting that place of curiosity to come from how can I get some information and or provide some new information to them to have them come to potentially a new understanding or belief about the other. Um, so, yeah, just a so, Atena, I'm having some difficulty hearing what you're saying, but what I was able to grasp, and please correct me if this isn't correct, is that you were suggesting for Rebecca's point the idea of coming from a point of curiosity to facilitate connection to folks whose ideologies are different from your own and whose values might be different from your own? Yes, and I apologize, I didn't have my headset in, but yes, you, you caught it, <laughs> you captured it. Okay. Thank you, okay. yes. <laughs> All right, thank you for that. Um, with that, Gloria, can we move to the next prompt? Wow. Okay. So it's interesting here, it seems the values that you all shared, respect, faith, inclusivity, justice, compassion, collaboration and unity, communication, determination, change in leadership, accountability, openness, all of these wonderful values. Some of them are the very same words that you use to frame your hopes. So that to me communicates a sense of hoping for shared values in the future and hoping for a society that reflects those shared values that are consistent with equity and justice for all and truly for all. Interesting. So for those of you who are here today, how do these values inform the steps that you take to work towards equity and justice in your spheres of influence? How do those values and hopes shape what you do Um, for me, it's speaking up when I see things that are unjust happening, not just for myself, but for the people who cannot speak up, who don't have a voice, and for that I'm just learning to share my voice. Um, it's just, you know, me letting people know that you can speak up against something that is not right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you for that. Others. Um, I agree with Angelette. And one of the things that's sort of been pushing me through and motivating me is thinking about rather than um, worrying about who I might offend, if I say something to speak up, thinking about 
who I'm hurting and offending if I don't say something. Mm. Um, that's been a real motivator. Yes. Lizzie, I like that. So Angela Ladd, I'm thinking about speaking up and then Lizzie thinking about taking a risk when speaking up because the risk of your silence is greater than perhaps speaking up in a way that is imperfect. That makes me think about something I have been working on, which is how I speak, how I speak up. I think that as someone who works at a college and who teaches in a college classroom often, it is really easy for me to like lean into intellectualization and referring to a whole lot of literature and research to support my points, which is very important, right? And very appropriate in some cases. And I think also there should be time and space for engaging in conversations about equity and justice that are accessible regardless of someone's experience with an interaction with an educational system, right? And so thinking about intentionally moving both in and out of that kind of degree of intellectualization or scholarship inclusion in conversation is really important for me. So thinking about how I speak up, absolutely. What about other folks? How do your values inform what you do, the actions that you take in your work towards equity and justice? If I can, um, I'm, I'm Mari Benassar. Hi, thank you, Brianna. Hello. Um, yeah, uh, I just want to say that, that uh, it, it, it was difficult actually to, uh, <laughs> Uh, frame these uh, questions in an eloquent way. Um, I think best I can say that these past years have been very um, challenging. I, I think probably everybody, <laughs> that's why we're here too, to having this conversation and this time. Um, and, and as a psychologist, I, I, you know, kind of getting the professional side is like, I know hope is the last thing. Hope is what moves us forward, right? When we lose hope, it, it, it's hard to um, survive, to move forward. I mean, it's like uh, consistently survivors in generations and generations. Uh, hope is what moves people to pass that. And, and I uh, wrote like respect, collaboration and unity uh, that I'm Dominican, I'm Latina. I think that comes a lot grounded in my um, familiar and cultural values, very personal values of mm -hmm. truth, transparency, collaboration, respect, and something that ha I have been very much um, <laughs> um, questioning it, how, how do I honor that uh, respect and, and truth and, and, and trusting each other? It's, it's an incredible, um, it's very personal. <laughs> so, um, so respecting others in spite of our differences, I think it becomes for me like a, a key or essential part on that collaboration or moving. And um, I assume making the assumption for me that we are most of all, uh, most of us are kind of have common goals. We want to make this country great in whatever. Said that in spite of having perhaps a common goal, we all have different definitions. Um, so that has helped me understand, wow, why this side or why this family member or this friend or why are these someone, you know, and negotiate that, well, it, can I come and, and, and appease myself with that? We probably are, have the same goal, but somehow we have different narratives and how do we respect certain ways and collaborate and, 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 and then move forward to, to, again, collaborate perhaps in different ways to, to move and achieve unity and equity like everybody mm -hmm. has, you know, most people, a lot of people have put it here. Um, mm -hmm. Appreciate these conversations, yeah. yeah. Thank you for that, Mari. And on that, that'll be our final opportunity um, to hear from attendees. But I want to say that something that was just said that really stands out to me is this idea of the need to hold on to hope to fuel our forward movement. And I resonate with that, or that resonates with me so deeply. Um, and I think that one of the reasons why I agreed with Gloria to join you all today was because 
I find opportunities like this to be deeply hope inducing and to be kind of things that fuel my capacity to continue to engage in the work, that there is hope in joining with others who value the legacy of Martin Luther King. There is hope in engaging in conversations about work towards equity and justice because it reminds us that we're not alone in our investment in that and we're not alone in our want to do that work and to continue to pursue it and to show up at 9 a.m. on a Friday from wherever we're located. Um, and so I so appreciate all of you for showing up, but also for doing the work of thinking about these things critically and engaging communally in conversations about it. Um, it's been a pleasure to speak with you this morning. Thank you so much all. Thank you very much, Dr. Brianna White, and thank you, Enan Rudell, Dr. Enan Rudell, for uh, providing our introductory remarks. Thank you for all of you for joining us this morning. Uh, please look out for some wonderful events coming up in the next two weeks. Um, our Dean of Students Office in collaboration with CMGMH has a wonderful evening of gratitude, hope and reflection through music. So please look out for that and join and look out for our list of February, uh, February Black History Month events. Thank you again, everybody, and have a wonderful Friday and a wonderful weekend.